sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the covenants of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to sing. From age to age my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness, for I am persuaded that your love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one, I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. And by your favor our might is exalted. Truly the Lord is our ruler. The Holy One of Israel is our King. A reading from Jeremiah 28, 5 through 9. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now 
to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members to slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We praise Thee, O God, we acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. 
all the earth doth worship thee, so Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven, Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The Father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous, and whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, None of these will lose their reward. Here ends the reading. A few people have asked me if I've set a date for resuming public in-person worship at our church, and I've hated to disappoint them, but the answer is no. In part because most of our parishioners are at elevated risk from COVID-19, and in part because we still wouldn't be able to sing together, or receive the Eucharist together, or have coffee hour together. The reopening committee and the vestry agree that trying to get back into church just isn't worth it right now. That no might be especially disappointing in light of how many other places have announced reopening dates, until you notice that one of the reasons why so many dates have been announced is that some of them are the same organizations publishing ever later dates. Remember when we thought reopening on Palm Sunday might be possible? But as that day, and Easter, and Pentecost passed by, I figured that not only was there no point in naming a target date, but that doing so could actually be harmful to parish morale, as missing that date would only bring more disappointment. And let me say that I am so proud of the morale and persevering spirit that I am seeing in our parish. In our Zoom chats and our one-on-one -on -one conversations, 
while many of our spirits are burdened, none have been broken, and most people still want to support the church and the community beyond. Most recently, in response to the demonstrations against police brutality, our parish and other congregations on Cape Ann are going to be working together, partnering with the League of Women Voters to do a voter registration drive. As others have said, let me reiterate, our building may be closed, but the church is open. One of the lessons of this experience has been a reminder of both our power and its limits. On the one hand, setting reopening deadlines gives the false impression that we have control of the situation or that we can know what course it will take. Setting goals can be a key element of success, but only when you can do something that will bring you closer to the goal. Setting a target date for the end of the COVID-19 pandemic is about as useful as setting a target date for the second coming. It'll happen when it happens. But there are ways to make life more bearable between now and then. I hope we'll all do our bit and avoid unnecessary trips and wear masks and check on people who are at risk and pray frequently. But while those are all good ways for managing the situation, and they might help make life better, and some of them might even help slow the spread of the disease, they aren't going to make a vaccine happen any faster. There are limits to how much we can change the world, and understanding the limits of our power is important. For example, I noticed a dramatic difference in the tone of Jesus' instructions to his disciples between last week's reading and this week's, even though they're part of the same discourse. Last week, Jesus was telling his disciples to expect hostility and prepare for the possibility of violent rejection. And today, he's talking about welcome and rewards. And there are no verses left out between last week and today. Despite the abrupt change of tone, Jesus is still giving the disciples a briefing before they go out on a preliminary missionary journey to the neighboring towns in Galilee. So what gives? Did Jesus just want to send them off on a high note? Give them some concluding encouragement? Maybe. But it seems more likely that Jesus was preparing them to accept a wide range of reactions, since the disciples could not control how people would respond to the message they would be bringing them. But while we have little power over the world around us, on the other hand, we have great power over ourselves. We can choose to be kind or cruel, gracious or obnoxious, considerate or selfish, open or closed. Most importantly, we can choose just how faithful to Jesus we will be. If the disciples had not been so faithful, they would have been unwilling to go on this journey, and Jesus would have had no reason to give them the lengthy instructions, which conclude with the part that makes up today's Gospel reading. Instead, they had faith in Jesus, and he had faith in them, and as a result, the Gospel was proclaimed, the sick healed, God glorified, and their faith increased. Just as we like to imagine that we have more power over the world than we do, we also like to excuse ourselves, claiming that we don't have the power to change. We couldn't possibly do things very differently than we are already comfortable doing them. And I think this is the subtext to the passage from Romans we hear today. Firstly, we have to choose if we are going to accept God as our sovereign. In making that choice, we should understand that if we reject God, we doom ourselves. Secondly, if we do choose God's offer of grace, we then have to choose whether to respond with our best effort at faithfulness or just go on sinning. Unlike modern writers who want to make their readers feel good, St. Paul makes no allowances for circumstance. If we sin, the reason why we sinned doesn't matter. 
That's because the negative consequences of sin are not punishment, but simply consequences. God, being a God of grace and love, does not punish us. But that does not mean that God suspends the mechanics of cause and effect. And the effects of sin can be difficult to predict. No one thought the COVID-19 pandemic would be so devastating or go on so long. Anyone who had predicted that would have been dismissed as an alarmist. But in hindsight, we can see that the sins of commission and omission related to health in this country have had profound consequences. Leaders from both parties at every level of government made mistakes in the early weeks of the pandemic, although much of that came from ignorance and the universal human tendency of denial. But let's be honest with ourselves. The problem is far larger than our leaders and this crisis. For decades, our nation as a whole persistently chose not to invest in health at the levels of our peer nations. We have made health care unnecessarily difficult to access. We have set low expectations of personal health, and we have underinvested in public health, disaster preparedness, and education. These things seemed too costly, but now we see we can't afford not to have them. If the virus had been as mild as many people, including myself, believed at first, then these sins, our sins, would not have had such terrible consequences. But instead, the virus revealed weaknesses in the system we collectively built and maintained. Weaknesses that exist because we just didn't want to make the hard choices. We can't decree the end date of this pandemic, but we can make sure the next one, and there will be a next one, doesn't get anywhere near this point. So let's consider what we can do. There's a reason why I always start these videos with confession and absolution. Getting right with God is vital to our spiritual health, which in turn determines our values and priorities and informs the rest of our decision-making. And as scary and uncertain as these days might feel, by all indications, the vast majority of us are going to get through this thing alive and well. When we do, of course, we will celebrate and give God our thanks and praise. But I think God wants more. Our faithfulness, our greater faithfulness, a greater intimacy with God, which reorders our goals and our choices, both as individuals and as a society. We live under grace, and so we are not doomed to repeat the mistakes that brought us here. The way to a better world is to rededicate ourselves to God with determination, hope, and and honesty. We can choose to subordinate our differences and end the idolatry of factionalism in order to build a society according to God's intentions for humanity. We can be intentional and proactive, aware and involved, each of us doing our part to share fearlessly the grace God has given us. Our power over the world is limited, but God's is not, and God is with us, now and always. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them, now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever and ever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope and we shall never hope in vain. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your Holy Church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I invite your own intercessions and thanksgivings at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where is a Heal 
sin-sick soul. Don't ever be discouraged, for Jesus is your friend. And if you lack for knowledge, He'll never refuse to Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore.